I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And this morning we're going to spend a little bit of time in Hebrews, but we're also going to jump into Genesis 4 and 5. So if you want to get your Bibles ready this morning, uh, put your thumb or put a marker, your bulletin back in Genesis 4 and 5 and open your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to do a whole series this fall. It might be seven or eight weeks on this chapter because it's considered the Faith Hall of Fame. And uh, I'd like to have you join with me. And Lord, we want you to come and be our teacher. We want you not to, to be restricted by me. We want you to flow freely to your people because you love us and you want us to know these truths. You want us to be transformed in the renewing of our mind. And so we give our time to you and ask that you minister your love, your truth, your correction to us. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, I'd like to go back just a little bit to uh, chapter 10 because out of chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is writing to Hebrew Christians who are tempted, once they found Christ, to go back into the old ways of the law sacrificial systems when they sin to offer animals and the author says last week if you go back into that there's no more sacrifice for you because Christ is paid for your sin debt once and for all there's no more sacrificial system it's once and for all it's the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world and he's writing these Hebrews who are tempted to go back and he writes them and he says remember how it was when you were first a believer you were persecuted. Some of you lost your property, but you endured it gladly, knowing that there is a house not made with hands eternal for you. And he began to speak to them about the presence of God in their own lives, that God would now write his laws on the hearts of mankind. And God would come, and he would stir, and he would speak, and he would bring a change from the inside out. And from that change... Uh, would move us into something new, a new horizon. And the only way that we as believers can get to the new horizon is not to look at some inner light, but to look to the author and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, who from outside of us leads us and sometimes drags us into his will so that we might inherit the promises and the purposes of God. What is it like for the believer to walk? by faith. It's to ignore the circumstances because the circumstances are just things in the way of God that he tends to move miraculously. How do we then walk by faith when things around us are saying the opposite? And that's what the author is zeroing in on as we look at verse 1 together today. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of the Lord, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which we obtained the testimony that he, has, uh, that he was righteous, God testifying about the gifts, about his gifts, and through faith. Though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, faith is often misunderstood. I remember when in the 70s, it was much more popular than now, thank God. But it's still popular for the word of faith people who um, will tell you to uh, claim things like you want a new boat, put it up on your refrigerator and start confessing that that boat is yours. And, uh, and all, it's, a lot of it is centered around selfishness and materialism. But I'm not really interested so much in that as I am 
laying hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. And there is a power that is released in the life of the believer when you come under the purpose and the mission of God. When the Holy Spirit stirs you and God backs you, there is a power beyond human power that is readily available to the life of the believer who is trusting in Christ Jesus from outside of himself to do the work of God. And I want to zero in in this series of, of talks that we're going to have in the next, this whole fall probably. And I want to zero in on how that faith played out. We're going to look at some really incredible Old Testament people and how that faith in God and what God spoke and how God led brought about things that they could never bring about themselves. And there is a power in the life of the believer. When you're called according to the purpose of God, all things work together for good. Now, when you're doing your own selfish thing, may you fail and may God help you fail. But when you're called according to the purposes of God, you're on mission and you have the backing of heaven. And that's the kind of thing that these people had that you and I covet is God's presence, his power, his working in your life beyond your own human limitations. We're going to see how God leads people in various ways. Um, in verse 7, we're going to see how God warned Noah. We're going to see in verse 8 how Abraham was called. We're going to see in verse 17 how Abraham was tested. All these are different ways that faith come. Through testing, through being warned, through being called, through seeing through the eyes of God and the prophetic like, like Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. And he gave, them, uh, he gave orders, uh, Joseph did, about his bones because he had a sense of destiny not to be in Egypt to, but to be in the promised land. Take my bones with you when you leave. And so we see that, there's, that there are different ways that God begins to birth faith in people and he speaks, he warns, he promises, he leads, he puts destiny in the heart, he, he shows what he does through your parents sometimes as the others inherited their parents' blessing. And we're going to see how God commanded them to go through the Red Sea and through a, a word of command, faith erupted and God changed the course of water and nature. So we're going to see all the different ways that God comes to his people. He speaks, he warns, he promises, he leads, he commands, he gives perspective beyond yourself, he puts destiny in your heart. And all of these people are examples of how God can work in the life of the believer today. And it's all different. Each one is a different story. So we're going to slow down and we're going to take these things, pick them apart, and we're going to see how God has worked throughout history using common, everyday people who believed and trusted in God. Now, what is the definition of faith? I want to start with point number one. What is faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or proof of things not seen. Faith is an assurance that God puts in your heart. Faith is the essence of things hoped for. It's, it is something that's there that's bigger than what you can see with your eyes, and it's there, and even though it's not material, it's real. Faith, faith is the assurance. Now, each one of these people, somehow God brought to them assurance. Assurance to believe and proof and conviction of things that they could not see with their eyes. And that's mainly how God calls us to walk, in the assurance that he gives us without seeing with our natural eyes to believe and trust and move our lives in belief in him towards what the assurance that he has placed within our hearts. I would like to read a definition of faith by J. Oswald Sanders. He says, faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present. And the invisible as seen. And when you think about it, 2 Corinthians 4.18 says that the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which you cannot see are eternal. 
And so we must walk by faith, not by what we see with our natural eyes. We don't perceive things in the kingdom of God um, like, like we see with our natural eyes. I like the song that we sang about Lead Me to the Cross, and it talked about believing now and passing right on into eternity believing. And we're going to see biblical characters, and we're going to identify with them because they were people just like you, and they were people just like me. So, uh, by faith, we understand that the worlds were created. By faith, verse 3, we understand that the worlds were prepared and created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made of things which are visible. I like it in Genesis 1. Um, some of us have a harder time understanding creation than our children. Why? Because they just take it for face value. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. And we're thinking, well, how did he create it? It must have been some kind of bang theory, or maybe it evolved or whatever. And the kids say, oh, no, God did that, you know. And uh, it goes in, and for... For those of us who would be confused, God said, you know, uh, he set the sun to move, rule the day and the moon by night. And the first, you know, the first uh, sunrise, the first sunset was the first day. And God did this within the first day. And we go, oh, that's easy. It's seven days. God created. And by the word of the Lord, we accept that by faith. Now, if you go to try to understand creation or evolution, it's, it, you, there's no proof. It's a leap of faith in what you decide you're going to believe. But by faith, we believe. And so I'm not really into, you know, for me, I don't need carbon dating. I don't need that. I take it by faith that God created the world. And that the first day he created this, and the morning and the evening of the first day he did this. And, and so he did it. And on the seventh day, he rested because it was done and it was complete. And we are to do the same thing. We are to have a day of rest. And so... By faith, we understand who God is by what he's created. Now, creation becomes a witness to you and me every time that we have a, a trial or hardship. The word of God spoke, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Amazing, isn't it? Second Peter tells us that God spoke the world into existence, that by the word and the voice of God, God spoke and things happened. Not by things that were visible, but just out of who God is and in the power of his spoken word, God created. Now, when you and I come to our lives and we see the things that God puts in our heart and God begins to speak things in our heart in many different ways, that has power to direct the course of history and your life. And so we're looking at how God speaks, how he calls, how he stirs, how he warns, how he gives perspective, how he leads us, how he drags us into his will, sometimes kicking and screaming. And we begin to understand that it's by faith that we're going to accomplish things that we could never accomplish ourselves, just like the world was created. So we join in all of God's creation because we are God's creation to bring glory and honor to the one who spoke. And it was so. So when God speaks, he starts things in motion. But there's usually a gap of time between when he speaks and when things happen. It was in uh, 1994 that God spoke to me about the spider web and the stacked deck. And somehow I... I knew that it was God, and I grabbed a hold of it. And that very word that God spoke to me has shaped my life in a different way. And hopefully it has made some difference in your life as well. But God spoke a promise, and as we live our lives out together in community, we begin to see the hand of God and the breath of God in our midst as community of believers who are trusting in Christ. We watch God work things out that are way beyond what we could ever dream or imagine. I can remember what it was like, uh, actually it was nice being gone to Alaska for a period of time because it was during that period of time that we were buying the building downtown and things would always come up and it looked like it was going to fall through the cracks. And I can remember one time uh, we couldn't get a hold of the banker and we needed a an appraiser uh, to do it before a certain time period or we would lose the sale and he wasn't answering his phone and so I jumped in the car 
And uh, I forget who it was. Oh, <laughs> it was Tim who was behind me and, and irritating me. And I thought, who is this guy, you know? And I'm passing and driving too fast to get to the bank because it's just before 5, and i got to get to the bank and talk to the thing. And I can remember all the intensity of watching something that I thought God was doing look like it was going to fall apart at any moment. But we re began to realize that when God wants it more than we want things, he speaks and things begin to happen and his will is unfolded and it's usually bigger than what we could ever dream or imagine. And much of what has happened here in our midst has been something so much greater than ourselves, so much greater than any one person could ever do because it's the fingerprints of God working because he speaks, he, he promises, he testifies. And I want to look at this passage of scripture today because um, obtaining a testimony, write that word down, write that phrase down, obtaining a testimony or gaining approval, as one translation says. These people gained God's approval. And it, it wasn't through works, it wasn't through impressing God, but it was through believing God in his word. How do you live with God's approval and blessing? How do you gain a testimony? We are a living epistle, and God wants to do something alive of himself through common, everyday people who trust in him. How do we gain that kind of testimony? Well, we're going to illustrate this to be together today as we look at uh, Abel and Cain, as we look at, at Enoch. These are good examples of people that God apprehended, that God spoke. He put something into their heart and it changed their lives. First of all, let's look at Cain and Abel, verse, uh, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony, there it is, through which he believed, he offered a better testimony, and through that he obtained a testimony of God in his life. Now remember, Last week in chapter 10, we talked about God said, I will dwell with you. I will put my laws and I will write them on your heart. And the work of the Holy Spirit is seen through Abel. And we see two people offering a sacrifice and God approving one and not approving the other. Gaining, gaining a testimony and not having a testimony. And we see that that's basically where you and I live. We're like Cain or we're like Abel in how we approach God, in how we live out our lives in faith or in our own work. Now, Abel obtained a testimony that he was righteous. Look at what it says in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, Though he is dead, he still speaks. There's a testimony that speaks to you and I together today about a man who trusted God in making an offering. Now, this is an interesting uh, story. As we go back to Genesis, go with me back to uh, Genesis chapter uh, 4. And I didn't put the verse down there. Okay, here we are. Talks about Adam and Eve having children in verse 1 of chapter 4. And she gave birth in chapter 2 to, uh, to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. But it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had uh, regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offerings, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. He became very angry and his countenance fell. If you do well, will, you not, will your countenance not be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about 
when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer of the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is that is too great for me to bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from the face I shall be hidden. And I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on earth, and it will come about that, that whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. Now we have two different people. They have a lot in common, and they have a lot that's different. First of all, they have in common the same parents. They were raised by Adam and Eve, and so um, they were raised and had the same uh, upbringing. They, um, they both believed in God. They both saw a need to make a sacrifice. And uh, when you come to God, when you bring a sacrifice, it shows that you're repenting because you can't go to God alone because you're unworthy and you realize there must be some atonement for your sin. So they both brought something of a sacrifice to God. But one of them, how are they different? One of them was accepted and one was not. One of them was blessed and walked with God in peace. One of them had no peace but was angry and rose up and killed his brother. One of them was blessed, and the other one, even his, his life would be changed because no longer would he have God's blessing on his gardening experience and his farming abilities. So what's the difference? Faith. One offered a sacrifice in faith, and one sacrifice was not in faith, and God rejected it. Now, let's go back to the first thing that they had in common. They were both raised by Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve must have told their sons uh, about how they sinned. They must have told them what it was like being in the garden. Hey, sons, before you were born, your dad and I, you know, mom's talking here, your dad and I walked in the garden, and God came in the cool of the evening, and every night we had this great walk, and we talked with God, and we talked about his creation, we talked about our purpose, and the presence of God was so real to us, and the only thing he said is, don't eat of this one tree, and we did. And, and we hid from God because we were ashamed. And as the shame began to overwhelm us, we did something. We hid from God, and we took some fig leaves, and we sewed them together to cover our nakedness because we felt shame for the very first time of being uh, open with our bodies. And so we sewed this this, these leaves together, and we formed this thing to hide our shame. And we hid from the presence of God, but God did not give up on us. He came looking for us in the garden, and he cried out to your dad, Adam, Adam, where are you? And he found us, and he said, what did you do? And you know, your dad blamed me. And when God turned to me and said, Eve, what did you do? He said, I blame the snake and you and God. So, and then you know what God did? Right before our eyes, we've never seen anything die before, but he took an innocent animal, and the weight of our sin was put on that animal, and God killed the animal, and he made clothes for us, and he covered our nakedness with a blood animal. And we saw something of the cost of our own sin and how it would take the life of the innocent to pay for our guilt. And so from that point on, we knew to walk with God and to have fellowship with God, we would have to go to God on his terms, and we would have to offer him a gift like we saw him do for us. Now, in this upbringing that Cain and Abel both had, one of them took the insight of their parents' history and story, and they made a, an offering that was in faith in how God dealt with them in their sin. And we find that Abel was, had a testimony, and God declared him righteous. 
Abel, you're righteous. And both of them repented. But one of them repented of his own righteousness, and one of them tried to go and make an offering to God to appease God, to earn his respect of God. And it's kind of like you and I. We, as people, we, we love to be religious in how we approach God. What can we do for God? And uh, I, I, I will tell you, uh, quite frankly, that a lot of pastors like it when people feel guilt because then they'll do more work for the church. And uh, how many times have you been in a church service where guilt is put on you, whether it's giving more money or working more? Oh, by the way, we need some volunteers for the building. And I'm being serious. I forgot to announce this. <laughs> now, I'm not saying if you volunteer, you uh, it could be an offering that, that could be accepted by God, but you don't gain God's approval by how hard you work. You know, if I can only be and get to this standard and I can, I can impress God and God will accept me because I work hard, because I, I, I do the right things, what do we hide behind? What offering do we give to God that's really not of faith? And how do you know if your offering is in faith or if it's not in faith? That's the question, right? How will you know if God accepts your offering or how will you know if you're not? Well, if God doesn't accept your offering, you never have rest. You never have rest. If you're here today, some of, I, I, I suspect that there might even be people here today who are coming to church to get on God's good side. You know, I said, God, if you work this thing out, I'll go to church for six weeks. You know, that kind of thing, that's an offering that you'll never find rest with. Both of these guys repented because they both brought offerings, but one repented of his self-righteousness. I don't have anything, Lord, that I could grow or make happen myself. I just give you what you gave me back, and I realize that it's, it's through your work that I must trust. It's kind of like the religious man and the, the heathen that went into the temple to pray. Do you remember that? And the Pharisee looked up to God, and he looked at the poor sinner, and he, said, and he says, God, I thank you I'm not like this guy, because he's not religious. And he doesn't tithe like I tithe, and he doesn't do all these good things that I do. And the self-righteousness, what you can do for God, you will never have peace. You'll never have it settled. But what did the poor sinner do? He beat himself on the chest and said, oh, God, I'm not worthy to even be in your presence Please forgive me. And what did Jesus say? That man went away forgiven and at peace with me. How do you gain a testimony? How do you gain God's approval? By walking with God in faith. Acting out what God has shown you and trusting in the work of Jesus, not yourself. You see, if you're here and you're trying to gain God's approval... You'll never be at rest, and you'll never have peace. And what was the end result with Cain? Cain was so mad, he said, first of all, he was mad at God, and he says, why didn't you accept my offering? And his countenance fell. And what did God do? Just like Adam and Eve, he went to him and said, no, wait a minute. Your countenance can change if you just do right, if you offer this gift in faith and not because of your own works and look at what you grew, if you can just come to God on the terms of what your mom and dad told you about the blood of an animal and the innocent sacrifice, yes, there were wave offerings in the Old Testament, there were grain offerings, but, but your brother offered a sacrifice that was in accordance with what I did with your mom and dad, and what I did with them is a true sign of how it's going to be forever. I'm going to send my son as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. If you would only do it God's way, and God comes after Canaan, he doesn't want him to fail. He doesn't want him to be rejected. But he doesn't go, and what does he do? He rises up, he kills his brother, and God goes to him. He says, what's this I hear crying up from the ground? It's your brother's blood. Why did you kill him? And then God says, here's what's going to happen. Because of you not responding to the sacrifice in faith and because I came to you and you refused to do it a different way, now 
the ground that you so much are into cultivating is never going to be powerful be producing fruit for you anymore and you're going to be on the run for the rest of your life you'll never be at peace with me and you'll never be at peace with yourself because you didn't act in faith and what does God really want from us is he really out to see how much you can do for God to impress him can you really gain God's approval by giving more money, more time? Can you work harder? Can you look better? Can you uh, have a slicker uh, uh, personality? Can you, can you do something that will impress other people? And surely God will rate you higher against other people because you're doing something better than other people? No, you'll never be at rest until you come to God on his terms and offer that sacrifice of trust in what God has called you to do. And so we see these two examples. And then we move on to Enoch in verse 5. So go back with me, if you will, um, to verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 11. And here in verse 5, we, say, we see that by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God took him, for he obtained, here it is, he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was what? He was pleasing to God. What's the testimony that we're out to obtain? To be pleasing to God. To be in line with God. Now, when we're off doing our own thing, we do not have the backing of God, and all things don't work together for good to those who are not called, who are not walking in faith. But for those who have the backing of God and please God, they obtain a testimony. What is God really interested in for your life? He wants you to turn away from your own plans and your own strategies for your own life, and he wants to come and from outside of you by his spirit. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to speak to you. And he calls you to trust what he says, even against what your mom and dad say, even against what other people say, but what God is saying to you, even what you think about yourself. God comes to you and he says, I want an offering from you. And I want you to believe what I'm saying, because what I believe and what I say created the world and it created you. And I have something of my destiny to unfold through your life. And if you, will, if you will walk with me in faith, walk with me in faith, you will see that you are pleasing to me and you will obtain a testimony that, that speaks to the whole world. One of the things that I continually scratch my, my shaved head about is that I feel like, like some of the promise that God made with the spider web was that he wanted to show the world a church that he would build. And, I, you know, I don't see that happening. Uh, it's, I see trickles, but I really don't um, see that happening. But I believe that God said that. And I believe, at first, I w wouldn't even say it because it sounds like you're being arrogant, just shut up. Um, but I had to really embrace what God said, and even though I don't see it now, I believe the assurance in my heart that God wants something more than I do. And if I walk in faith, um, I can obtain a testimony that will show the world who Jesus Christ is. And you are being called by God to be a living epistle to show the world who Jesus is, to obtain this testimony of what your life can be like under the rule of God as you trust him. Well, we see in Genesis 5 again, go back to Genesis 5, because... Uh, we're going to read about Enoch because Enoch is a great character of the Bible. I just love this character that um, is given to us here in uh, Enoch. Look at verse 5, verses 21, chapter 5, verse 21. Now Enoch lived 65 years and he became the father of Methuselah. 65 years old, he becomes the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God. 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. 
Something that jumps out at this text to me is this. Enoch lived 365 years, but he only walked with God 300. Ah, good question. What happened the first 65 years? And what does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean for you? What did it mean for Enoch? How do we walk with God? And what happens when you're not walking with God? There's a time in our lives before we come to faith in Christ and put our trust in him, take our first communion, so to speak, as we did a few weeks ago. For some of us, we trusted Christ for the first time, his blood for our sins. And as we did that, something happened, and you are then at peace with God, and you're walking with God. And I think that this is important because to walk with God is not a normal thing that you're born with. Did you know this? Enoch was not walking with God the first 65 years because he was an enemy of God. And he did not obtain God's approval, and he had no testimony of God's markings in his life for the first 65 years. Why? Because you are born into sin, and the Bible tells you that just because you're a good person, what does God think? You're an enemy. You're alienated. You're separated. You're at war with God until you come to the place of surrender to trust Jesus Christ for his blood to forgive you and for you to give your life as an offering to God. You are basically at war with God if you've never trusted Jesus Christ. You were separated. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world as the prince of the power of the air that governs the world. And the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Listen, folks, being raised right and being a good person does not make you at peace with God. And Enoch was not at peace with God for 65 years. What happened 65 years later that brought him into a relationship with God where he then started walking with God? What happened? Methuselah was born. Now, I don't know, but the Bible tells us that there's something tied to Methuselah's birth that brought a change, a life change, that made Enoch at peace with God, who was once an enemy, separated, alienated, under the course of the power of this world. Suddenly, he's at peace with God, and he's walking with God. And the first thing we see about walking with God is Genesis, when Adam and Eve are walking with God in the cool of the night before they fell. To walk with God means to live out your life, to practice your life before the presence of God under his control under his rule, under his headship. And we find that Enoch, for 65 years, was an enemy. He was at war with God, but something happened that settled the war, and the war ended when Methuselah was born. Now, let's go, just go with me one more place, and that's all we'll be going to uh, besides our text. Go with me to Jude. It's just before Revelation in the back of, the, of your New Testament. Jude is a real short book. It's just between 3 John and uh, the Epistle John, that is, and Revelation. And there we find a description that nowhere else in Scripture is given to us about Enoch. In chapter, uh, it's only one chapter, in verse 14 of Jude, it says about and about these also, Enoch, in the, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied. Now, before Enoch, for 65 years, before Enoch walked with God, he was an enemy of God. And now, as he walks with God, he's now a prophet. He's prophesying. So Enoch is now a prophet. Listen to this. He prophesied, saying... Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to convict all of the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in the ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Which means that Enoch walked in a very harsh time in history. And actually, there's only um, three people, basically three or four people, um, that really, Abel, 
uh, and, and Hebrews picks it up, Abel and Enoch and Noah were very unique in that in their times they stood out and they found favor with God and they pleased God and they gained a testimony with God and all the rest of the world was remained as an enemy of God. But something happened with this Enoch character that changed his life at the birth of his son. And do you know what Methuselah means? Here's what Methuselah means. This gives us an insight, I believe, into um, some of the change that might have happened uh, with Enoch at the birth of his son, Methuselah. His name means when he is dead, it will come. When Methuselah dies, and it's interesting to see that God held the flood up until Methuselah died. So somehow, this Enoch became a prophet as he walked with God. And we see that he laid hold of a revelation, he believed a revelation, and he gave the name to his son, that son, when you're, die, when you're dead, this thing's going to come. And he also prophesied not only about the flood and the coming judgment, he also prophesied about the second coming of Christ, the Lord will come to judge the earth and he will come with his thousands and thousands. And we see that in Revelation. So Enoch became a prophet. And God spoke to him some kind of promise that he believed. And he must have heard from God that he wasn't going to die, that God was going to take him. Now, there are only two people in the Bible who escaped death. One is Enoch and one was the prophet Elijah. Remember? Swing down chariots, stop and let me ride. Remember the fiery chariots that came and took him and he didn't die? Well, Enoch was a picture much like Elijah as he became a picture of a whole generation of people who will not see death. He's a type. He speaks of the coming judgment and he speaks of being taken before the judgment and we see that he becomes a type for all of those, a whole generation of people who will not die. And I find this interesting. He obtained a testimony that was pleasing to God, and Enoch took him. God took Enoch without Enoch dying, just like Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we'll be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. For this mortal must put on immortality. And this perishable must put on that which doesn't perish. And then will come the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. God has chosen people who put his faith and trust in him. At the coming of Jesus for his church, there will be a whole generation of people at the last trumpet, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When the archangel of God sounds the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we will always be with the Lord. Folks, do you believe that God has better things for you? Do you believe that it's not on your own merits and there's nothing you can do to obtain God's approval except for what he's already done? Do you believe that anything that God does in your life that flows from him is not because of you, that it's because of his grace, that undeserved favor? Do you believe that it's because God chose you and you found approval and he's making a living testimony out of your life that still is going to speak to other people around you? How does that happen? Through you working and striving? No, it's through you settling the war with God, learning to walk with God on his terms, being at peace with God, watching the fingerprints and the mark of God lived out in your life so that you became and become a living example of someone under the control of Jesus Christ. And God wants you. He loved you so much that he would send his only son into the world that if you would believe in him, not work for him, if you would believe in him, you will not perish, 
but you will have everlasting life. God is looking for people. Now I'm going to close with this verse. Look at this verse. This is so cool. Verse 16 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's so powerful. Listen to what it says. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, here it is. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. God is preparing a city for you. And guess what? God is not ashamed to call you his child. Why? Because the war is settled. You're walking with God and you're obtaining a testimony of how God lived out in the life of a normal person can be marked with divine action because God wants it more than you do. Can we pray together? Father, we're amazed at your love. We're amazed that you would choose us we're amazed that we're not impressive in that of ourselves, but you loved us while we were enemies, while we were separated. And so, Father, I pray for those here today who are not at rest. They're not at peace with you because they've never experienced your forgiveness through faith. I pray, Father, that they would lose their religion and gain you today in Christ's name. Amen.